I'd like to welcome everybody, both our presenters and our audience. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Krupel and I'm the director of the UF Center for European Studies. Uh, our center is a Jamonet Center of Excellence as well as a Title VI National Resource Center. And we are housed in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, but are a multidisciplinary area and language studies center with uh, faculty and students from across the university. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's presentation and discussion uh, will be recorded and it will be available on the CES website. We will have a Q&A session following the presentations and we ask participants to submit questions using the Q&A button rather than the chat function. I want to thank everyone for joining us today to discuss a new era, Germany after Merkel. This presentation was organized in collaboration with the European Council on Foreign Relations and focuses on the results of a public opinion poll conducted by them on post Merkel Germany run in 12 EU countries. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jana Puglerin, uh, head of the ECFR Berlin and senior policy fellow. She also directs ECFR's Reshape Global Europe project, which seeks to develop new strategies for Europeans to understand and engage with the changing international order. Before joining ECFR, she headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And prior to this, she was an advisor on disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation in the German Bundestag, where she also worked on matters relating to German and European foreign and security policy. Our second panelist is uh, Raphael Lost, coordinator for Pan-European Data Projects. Prior to joining ECFR in 2020, Mr. Loss was a research associate at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in Livermore, California, so my home stomping grounds. Uh, and he also has held a Fulbright Fellowship with the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where he earned an MA in International Relations. Our third and final panelist is Dr. Marcel Lewandowski, who is the DED Visiting Professor at the Center for European Studies. His research and teaching focuses on comparative politics with special emphasis on parties and party systems, populism in Europe, and the political system of Germany. Dr. Lewandowski received his doctoral degree in 2013 with a study on German regional elections from the University of Bonn. From 2012 to 2013, he was a lecturer at the University of Lüneburg. Uh, and from 2013 through joining us in 2019, he worked as a lecturer at the University of the Federal Armed Forces in Hamburg. At the end of the event, just to warn everyone, you will be taken to a brief survey. And we really do ask that you take a few moments to complete it. It helps us in our efforts to provide panels and engagement such as this. I want to note that during the talk to avoid distraction, I will be muted uh, and stop my video, but I will come back during the questions and answer period. And with that, I think I will hand it over first to Professor Lewandowski, and then you can all work as a panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Capel. Uh, thank you uh, all for joining and thank you, Jana Plugerin and Raphael Loss for presenting uh, your findings to us uh, today. Since we only have uh, an hour, and I will also join you later as a, a discussant and commenter on your presentation, I would like to hand it over directly to you. And uh, whenever you're ready, please share your screen. Um, and um, we go with Jana Brugerin first, then Raphael Loss, and then I will come back in, comment on your presentation, and then we're open to space for the Q&A. We start with Raphael and then I'll take over and then he takes over again. So we do a <laughs> little bit of me. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> Make everything a bit more confused. Stand up comedy. Go. We will figure it out. <laughs> German efficiency. Yay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, just just to 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 introductory remarks on, on the structure um, of, of Jana's and my presentation. First of all, thanks very much for having us. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, our talk will, will focus on uh, uh, public opinion survey that, that we as ECFR conducted earlier this year. Um, we'll look at in the first part on, on European assessment of uh, Germany's leadership and the Angela Merkel over the past 16 years. A uh, brief second part will recap the results of the German elections and what they might mean for the next uh, German government. And then uh, finally, I will, I will take a look at what Europeans expect of the next German government. So Jana, over to you. Yeah, and I think... Um... 
you can already start sharing your screen. Um, fabulous to be with you, very much looking forward. Um, thank you for joining and for listening to just another event on Germany and the German elections. I think <laughs> Germany was quite well discussed in recent weeks, um, but please bear with us. Maybe we have something different um, to tell. So um, what I'm going to present in the beginning is ba basically um, the Europeans' public perception of Germany and um, Angela Merkel, so of the past 16 years. As Rafael has said, we are, I mean, we have conducted um, a survey in 12 European um, member states, kind of quite representative selection of North, uh, South, East, West and the center, um, basically covering two thirds um, uh, of the German population. And what we wanted to know is what do other Europeans um, think about Germany? Um, how do they perceive it? Do they trust Germany? What do they think of um, Angela Merkel? And also we wanted to, to learn this um, from the Germans. So, so this is a public poll, not an expert poll. Um, and maybe we could just um, go right into it. So um, I present um, the German leadership in Europe part. We asked um, people a hypothetical question, namely um, whom they would vote for as the president of Europe, a post that position that um, doesn't exist as such, um, if there were only two candidates, uh, Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel. And we um, chose those two, I mean, Angela Merkel, of course, because our interest was to find something um, about Germany, but um, Emmanuel Macron, because we thought that these two are basically standing for different um, visions of um, leadership in Europe, whereas Angela Merkel is always very, um, has been very much focused on inclusivity, I mean, with of course, some um, some big exceptions, looking at Nord Stream or the migration um, crisis. But in general, Angela Merkel has always tried to get everybody on board, keep the club together, find a compromise, work with the smaller member states, whereas uh, but but also very much administrating the status quo, um, uh, leading without big visions for the future, basically um, taking things as they are, uh, crossing bridges when um, she came to it, and not a very yeah, visionary uh, leader, but stable, steady, um, and also always seeking to make it work for everybody. Whereas Emmanuel Macron as a leader stands for uh, a rather ambitious and visionary approach, um, he all, often emphasized that he wanted to uh, move forward and if not with everybody because that was too slow and too painful then with those willing and able um, and so we thought yeah th those leaders stand for two different uh, visions and what we found out is that basically Angela Merkel's vision or her way of leadership um, is way more popular um, than that of Emmanuel Macron. And um, that is the case basically throughout the EU. Of course, I mean, she's much more popular in the Netherlands and in Spain than in France and Bulgaria, but still the kind of um, the distance to Emmanuel Macron is quite striking. So we see that in Angela Merkel would have won this election easily in all of the member states where we polled, including in France. And there are only kind of very few people in our survey who um, who voted or who, who prioritized or favored um, uh, Emmanuel Macron um, in this, his own um, uh, La République En Marche, uh, but also interestingly, the right wing AFD in Germany kind of supporters um, were more in favor if, of Emmanuel Macron and also peace voters in Poland. Um, but yeah, maybe we leave this slide um, for now. So we wanted to find out whether there was some um, sort of connection between the kind of the feeling of people, um, the, the sense that people had of a European identity, kind of whether people felt Euro European or not, whether this mattered um, with regards to their view of Germany. Um, and we found out, uh, we asked basically, this is a combination of two questions. We asked people, um, uh, being European is at least as important to me as being my nationality. And then people had several uh, degrees of um, agreeing. And we kind of looked how that um, corresponded with um, the perception of Angela Merkel. And 
we found out that the stronger um, people felt European, the more they were likely to support um, Angela Merkel. So Germany is some sort of prison uh, for many people. It's um, it has this um, yeah, it's publicly perceived as a pro-European um, country with um, a certain set of values. And if you align with uh, kind of <laughs> pro-Europeanness and those values, you are much more likely to see uh, Germany uh, positively. And those that don't feel very much European are less likely uh, to be uh, positive about Germany. So there is, um, there is a certain connection. This to me is one of the most interesting slides because we asked people in a world without Angela Merkel, would there have been more or less conflict if she never had become um, chancellor? And although, I mean, we clearly see basically a pacifying effect of Angela Merkel, um, many or more people said there would have been more conflict without Merkel than those that said the, the world would have been a better or more peaceful place. Um, without her, but still, um, I think that the the, the yellow um, bars in the in the center uh, are interesting because um, I mean most people have or the majority or the kind of plurality um, of people have um, chosen yellow um, and that Angela Merkel didn't make um, so much of a difference and we or I thought this is an interesting contrast to her popularity that when it comes to foreign policy and her role on the world stage um, especially when it comes to conflict management um, wasn't that uh, impressive to many so um, and uh, yeah didn't really um, make a lasting impression. So um, maybe some sort of mixed balance here. Um, so keep in mind that uh, Germany is seen very positively and we have other slides um, where we um, come to later where we show that there's a lot of trust in Germany, but that contrasts um, quite drastically with the perception uh, of Germany when it comes to Germany's golden age um, in economic terms, but kind of as a prospering um, uh, economy. So that especially in Germany itself, um, more than half of the Germans think that Germany's golden age is basically over and uh, harder days are to come, followed by the Austrians and the Hungarians. Um, and overall, um, the tendency to think that uh, Germany's golden age is in the past is, is especially prominent yeah, in Germany itself and in some member states, whereas others um, like um, in Spain or Portugal or also Sweden um, are more optimistic um, that Germany's golden age is basically today. But, but looking um, at the future, um, this is, hasn't been um, the strongest answer option in, in any of the countries. So it seems that um, people tend to think either that the glorious uh, days for Germany are in the past or are currently happening, but when it comes to the future, there is a significant amount of doubt. And I think it's especially noteworthy to look at Germany here, because if the Germans don't think that kind of the, the best is ahead of them, that impacts significantly um, also, I think the, the, the opportunities or the capital for the next um, uh, a German government to, to lead in Germany. And I give uh, the floor to Raphael now. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, as promised, uh, a brief recap of the, of the German election that took place on, on September 26th. Um, these are uh, the results uh, from, from the sort of preliminary final results. Uh, we expect that the final, final results uh, will be issued today but there uh, uh, will not be much of a change in terms of uh, the rough percentages or even, even the mandates. There might be one or two seats that might be flipping or uh, being added, but, but not much in the overall picture will shift. Um, we see here a comparison between the results from 2017 and, and 2020. We see that the uh, SPD, uh, uh, which was part of uh, Angela Merkel's last grand coalition, um, performed uh, quite strongly, gaining five percentage points compared to 2017. We also see that the Angela Merkel's party, the CDU, um, which uh, decided on, on new leadership earlier this year um, in the form of Armin Laschet, uh, lost a bunch of votes um, uh, across Germany. Um, we also see that the Greens picked up some votes. We see that the FDP picked up some votes. Uh, and we see that the 
uh, far left and far right parties, the left, the Linke, and the AFD, the alternative for, for Germany party, um, both lost votes, um, although uh, the, the far left party was struck a bit harder than the far right party, um, which has apparently consolidated itself as part of the German political spectrum with some interesting implications, I think, for, for German politics and into the future. Um, how this translates into seats in the next German Bundestag, um, which likely look like that with the SPD forming the largest parliamentary group, um, the CDU shrinking significantly. The Greens will represent the, the third largest party grouping followed by the FDP, the AFD, the left party, and then there's one um, uh, seat that will go to a regional minority party uh, that Danish peoples in, in Northern Germany uh, who aren't bound by, by uh, the 5% threshold that applies to all the other parties. Um, and therefore, we'll be able to send one representative into, into the next German Bundestag. How this translates into uh, potential government coalitions. Um, if you follow German politics, you'll know that currently the SPD of Olaf Scholz, the Greens uh, under Annalena Baerbock and Robert Habeck, and the FDP with Christian Lindner are uh, in exploratory talks, have been for the past couple of weeks. Um, it looks like uh, they'll announce tomorrow that they might enter formal coalition negotiations. Um, no one can quite know how, how fast the next German government will form, but if they're successful, then this, this will be the first um, uh, three-party coalition uh, forming a German government since the 1950s, um, uh, sort of unprecedented in, in modern German politics. Um, uh, uh, what might also happen uh, if those talks don't pan out is a so-called Jamaica coalition under uh, Armin Laschet and the CDU, but with the Greens and the FDP as well. You see that they all comfortably get across the 50% um, uh, threshold. Um, we could also imagine a return of a grand coalition, but with the SPD at the helm instead of the CDU, um, uh, uh, a Germany coalition, which was talked about in, in, uh, during the elections, um, and has been uh, implemented in other, in other German states uh, now as a, as a sort of experiment for the first time and would be an over large majority. So, so that, is, that is quite unlikely. Um, uh, German politics is resistant to forming coalitions that are unnecessarily large. Uh, German politics is also un, un, unwilling or has been unwilling to form minority governments. And that's why the, the R2G option, uh, meaning two red parties, the SPD and the left, um, together with the Greens, uh, which don't get uh, uh, enough uh, seats to, to make it across the 50% threshold here, um, uh, would be able to form a government. <clears throat> so much for the, for the outcomes of the German elections. Now, what um, are, are Europeans expecting of the next German government? Uh, referring to the same survey results that, that Jana discussed earlier, we see that um, trust is quite high when it comes to German leadership on economic issues and when it comes to human rights, democracy, rule of law issues. Um, uh, it's less prominent um, uh, on issues of, of uh, European defense and security and, and uh, Europeans trust Germany least on handling relations with the world's made up powers, the United States, um, uh, Russia and China specifically here. Looking specifically at, at economic and, and financial issues and, and the question of German leadership, we also see that uh, uh, trust in German leadership uh, is sort of distributed more or less equally in all corners of the European Union. We see that Hungarians um, uh, appreciate German leadership on economic issues. We also see that uh, Spaniards and, and Portuguese, uh, as well as uh, Bulgarians, for instance, uh, see Germany leading with good example, uh, least trusting our Italians and, and Polish. When we look at uh, democracy and human rights issues, uh, similarly, uh, respondents from Spain, from Hungary, from uh, the Netherlands and Denmark, representing different uh, sort of ideological uh, corners of, of the European Union, uh, all trust German leadership. Again, Italians and, and Polish are, are least trusting. When we look at relations with uh, the three great powers, we see that while the 12 member states uh, sort of land in a certain hierarchy of, of trusting Germany with, with Hungarians at the top in, in all three cases uh, and Bulgarians at the bottom uh, when it comes to relations with the United States and China. Um, Poland trusts Germany least on, on, on Russia. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, yeah, you can, you can see a certain tendency that, that some countries tend to trust German leadership uh, on foreign relations more than, than others. 
This translates into a uh, interesting correlation, uh, considering again this question that Jana discussed earlier, whether people believed um, that Germany's golden ages in the past and the present are still to come. Then we see uh, uh, that respondents who are sort of uh, more uh, pessimistic about uh, about German leadership also tend to trust German leadership uh, less. Uh, uh, the only uh, flip side is really uh, people who believe that Germany's golden ages in the past also believe that Germany, German leadership on none of these issues, the very bottom option here, um, uh, can be trusted really. We've also found a certain um, uh, gap of perception and self-perception of Germany. So looking at the issue of defense and security, for instance, we found that only 20% of Germans would say that they trust German leadership on that issue, whereas 29% of all other respondents or respondents from all other countries would say the same. Um, similarly, we, we see a gap on, on trusting German leadership on economic and financial issues. It's a bit narrower, but nevertheless, Germans are less trusting of themselves than, than other Europeans are trusting of them. Uh, there's less of a gap when it comes to handling relations with China, with Russia. Um, here, uh, both Germany's expectations of itself and, and European expectations of Germany um, are quite low, uh, in fact. Um, and uh, when we look at handling relations with the United States and the issue of democracy and human rights, we see that Germans are actually more confident uh, Europeans are trusting in German leadership. In this. A similar uh, gap in expectations exists um, uh, on the question whether Germany will turn more nationalistic in the, in the coming years. Uh, Germans tend to not believe that. Um, you see that 36% uh, of Germans in fact believe that, that Germany will become more focused on helping other Europeans whereas 19% of German respondents will believe that Germany will become more nationalistic. Uh, the, the reverse almost is true of uh, respondents from the other 11 uh, European countries, where we see that 27% of them believe that Germany will turn nationalistic and only 25% believe that Germany will be focused more on helping other Europeans. Um, uh, we think that, that this overall picture provides uh, a strong mandate for the next German government certainly to be more active on foreign policy. Um, when we look at dealing with uh, uh, rising uh, systemic competition between the United States and China, but also the future of relations um, with Russia, both the bilateral German-Russian relationship, but also the European-Russian relationship, then there's certainly a, a gap of leadership in Europe, um, a potential for the next German government to, to play a bigger role here, um, to lead, but lead by uh, uh, bringing Europeans together. And with that, I'll hand it over to Marcel. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jana Puglielin and uh, Rafael Loss, for uh, these extremely interesting insights uh, into very fresh data. I think there is um, a lot to discuss in there, a lot of interesting results. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing um, your, your insights with us. Um, there's some things I would like to highlight with regard to, uh, to your presentation, and there are others, other things I uh, might uh, uh, bring up in terms of um, speculating a little more on the outcomes of the of the elections, but always um, in the light of what you just presented us, at least. So, um, for all attendees, if you have any questions or comments, please use uh, the Q and A. You find it at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then we we'll try to moderate that um, after uh, my uh, remarks, which I would like to keep as short as possible so we have more time for discussion. Um, so what I find interesting is that you're like the overall narrative um, that you are uh, that you are presenting us is a leadership. So leadership has two dimensions, right? Um, any leadership, not only German leadership, of course. Uh, one is foreign, one is domestic. And both are not independent from each other. One is a perception of uh, German non-nationals or uh, citizens of other countries, and the other is a perception of uh, German citizens. And what I'm wondering is how big is the degree to which these two might overlap or are there major differences? And might some differences be due to the fact that Angela Merkel uh, was governing in a very specific coalition, which was a grand coalition in which she was also domestically relatively powerful because the SPD was quite supportive of her um, of her uh, leadership, um, even in, um, in in policies 
where there were differences, for example, when it came to uh, to the euro crisis. So the um, and the question is, and I might come back to that later, how will this play out in a totally different coalition, which is not a love match at all, uh, the traffic light coalition that might come into place as an outcome of this election. But let me get, get back to that later. So what I'm saying is that Mm, I would like to comment on some specific aspects that I found interesting. I might have some questions here. I'd like to talk a little more about what to expect or what not to expect from a new uh, German government if the traffic light coalition really comes into effect, um, which might be the most likely result uh, at this point in time. So um, German leadership in Europe. Um, I might go a little more into detail here because there were some questions that stood out and i just would like to hear your opinion on that and how into and uh, how you interpret your data what does explain the virtual vote of angela merkel over emmanuel macron um because i find that quite interesting and i'm wondering um what is in there what does it have to do with? Why is um, in most countries Angela Merkel um, seen in a more positive way? I think this is what we're actually seeing here uh, overall uh, than Emmanuel Macron. Is it a specific stance on Europe? Because Europe is, because Emmanuel Macron represents a more, um, I would say, supranational approach, whereas Merkel is more supportive of an intergovernmental approach. So is this like, um, somebody like Angela Merkel preserves national sovereignty, while as Emmanuel Macron might go a little too far. Is that what we're seeing here? Or are we seeing a effect of uh, ideology? Are we seeing a um, effect of um, the domestic power they represent? Because Angela Merkel is seen as domestically powerful, whereas Angela, Emmanuel Macron is clearly struggling. So does that come into play here? Um, to me, it seems that it's most likely that this are that both are, as I said before, representing two ideas of how Europe should be governed or Europe should function. Um, but I wonder what you have to say to that. Um, the other question that comes into play here is um, the golden age of Germany. Um, what I find interesting is that, if I'm not mistaken, 52% of respondents in Germany said that the, uh, the, the golden age of Germany uh, is, is in the past. Um, so what does that actually mean? Um, so I'm wondering what exactly we are measuring with this item. And I am assuming that we are measuring um, democratic satisfaction in a country and trust in government. Um, at least, uh, maybe it not, it's not exactly a proxy, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. So I am wondering whether this item with regard to Germany shows us that a next government is carrying a heavy burden, or for the sake of the discussion, it's maybe even sitting on a tinderbox. Um, because we know that dissatisfaction with democracy pretty much supports voting for um, uh, populist and extremist parties. In the German context, it would be populist parties. There are two of them, the left and the right, the, le uh, uh, the, the, the left and the AFD. And I'm wondering whether that shows us maybe to an extent that if the traffic light coalition doesn't deliver, the mainstream parties might have a problem domestically. So, um, this is something that 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 struck me when I when I saw it, and I wonder what you um, would say about this. Now let's get to the expectations. What I find extremely interesting, again, this is another detail, um, is that the trust of Germany's or in Germany's role in defending democracy and human rights was the highest in Hungary. That is something that really struck me. Because at the same time, what we see in Hungary is relatively high or extremely high support for the, for the Orban government. So, um, and we also know that um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 there's an ongoing conflict between, between, uh, between Germany and, and, and other countries and the Orban government in terms of how, how Hungary uh, handles their own democracy. So um, I am wondering what we're seeing there. And this is, again, an open question. Uh, I can only speculate on that, but that is something that I'm really interested in. Is that a sample bias um, or 
Um, do we, what are we actually looking at here in terms of Hungarian domestic politics? Have you, do we have an explanation for that? So when it comes to the golden age um, and the correlations at the very end of your presentation, I wasn't surprised that the highest correlation was actually, if I didn't get it wrong, um, the highest correlation was like with economic policy and economic expectations, right? Right. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, because right, normally any question that refers to some idea of a golden age is an empty signifier. But what you can show, and I really appreciate that, is that it has to do with specific policies. Now, I'm wondering, however, um, whether that is due to Germany's still relatively comfortable economic situation. And this now speaks to what we saw before with the golden age that is in the past. What happens if the German economic situation changes um, and um, the, uh, the government, the German government, the new German government is not able to remedy any hardship, hardships that might come? So what happens then at the domestic level in Germany? Right now, from what I'm seeing here, Germany is seen as a, as a strong leader, as a stable democracy and so on. It also seems like it, if we look at the data on uh, satisfaction with democracy at the domestic level um, and, and trust in government, but actually what one oh, sometimes overlooks is that satisfaction with domestic democracy also in Germany is heavily correlated um, with social strata with income, with education, especially with social strata. And you see that there are certain social strata in which, um, in which um, the trust in government is relatively low and also satisfaction with democracy is relatively low. So what can happen in the future is if, if Germany is not doing well economically, um, the, uh, um, the, the, the trust or the satisfaction in democracy can like decrease even more and that might then um, lead to uh, a, a governmental crisis um, in some way. And that leads me to the coalition that we're looking at. So what are we looking at here? As I said, the traffic light coalition is not a love match. It is a love match between the SPD and the Greens, but the FDP actually does not want to join the coalition. The FDP has preferred, prefer, preferred Jamaica for a good reason um, from their perspective, because they, um, the majority of their uh, voters would have preferred Jamaica far by far over the traffic light. That has changed after the election due to the, let's say, poor performance of the CDU-CSU leadership, um, I would say. But now it looks a little different, but still the FDP, in contrast to SPD and Greens, cannot sell, sell the traffic light coalition to their voters as their preferred, preferred project. They have to pretend to be the party that works as a corrective in a project they normally wouldn't join. So what does that mean in practical terms? What I suspect, and I wonder what, what you would say about this, I suspect that the um, FTP in the coalition negotiations will get this, uh, the Ministry of Finance. So Lindner will most likely become Minister of Finance. If that happens, he has a veto right. Um, and a Green Minister of Finance would be closer to a Chancellor Olaf Scholz, although he's a conservative social democrat, than Christian Lindner is. So um, at the same time, a minister of finance in Germany is also responsible, is the, the responsible member of, ca of cabinet when it comes to European economic policy. Now, the FDP has a red line in its, um, in its um, demands for a coalition with the SPD and the Greens, and that is no new taxes, no tax raises. Um, and given the fact that the um, performance of the FTP was relatively poor in the negotiations 2017, they will remain with that red line, I'm absolutely sure. But the, uh, the projects of SPD and Greens might cost much. And at the European level, Olaf Scholz, in contrast to uh, Armin Laschet, his focus, I would say, is not so much on a common for, let's say, military policy in the European Union. It's more focused on um, a common economic policy. Um, and we have seen that um, with the global minimum tax. Um, the global minimum tax has been ex accepted by uh, 136 countries now, um, including uh, European countries that were formally against it. But that's just the starting point. And that is a social democratic project. So I'm wondering whether European economic policy, given maybe also certain events that we can foresee it, could become a tinderbox on which this uh, traffic light coalition is sitting at this point. I said, I don't talk for too long, I failed.
I am sorry, but it was super interesting. Uh, thank you so much. And I, um, if everybody agrees, um, would give hand it over to Amy Kreppel um, and then to our discussion. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm not allowed to put a question in the Q&A box, apparently, as a, as a panelist, which is unfortunate. Um, so I'm also going to throw to the panelists a question. Um, I am uh, an EU scholar, and so I've been thinking a lot about the impact of this last election and of Merkel's exit from the political stage on the European Union as a whole, and in particular, the kind of um, the sort of unifying force in many ways that Merkel has been, even as Germany was a lightning rod in things like the Euro crisis with Greece, there has been a natural tendency within the broader spectrum of a historic Franco-German axis for the tilt to be towards the German side and for Merkel to sort of be, serve the role of the calm, solid leader that people could turn to in a storm. And with her exit, whoever takes over in Germany they will not have this capacity, at least not initially. They will be new, they will have a difficult coalition to manage, they will have to establish themselves within the domestic sphere, and that will not leave them a lot of opportunity or even capacity to, to lead Europe, right? So then who, who does that? <clears throat> I had initially assumed it would be Macron, because really who else would it be, especially after Brexit? Not that it would ever have been Boris Johnson, but it certainly wouldn't be somebody from the UK. So if Macron is so unpopular in the EU context, you know, can can he play this centralizing leadership role? And if not Macron, my goodness, who who would it be? And what does that mean for EU politics and EU leadership moving forward. And just if you have any ideas about that, or if you think I'm being overly pessimistic about the future of continued German leadership in that role. Um, so there are, of course, <clears throat> uh, there's also a, a question in the chat window. So Marcel, I'll let you manage that, but perhaps we can throw it back to our two panel, our two other panelists for responses to your comments. And then if they would like to also a question, you know, my question. So um, then I go first. Um, that gives me the opportunity to pick and choose and leave the rest to Raphael. Um, I start with the uh, leadership question, who leads Europe? Um, I'm less pessimistic than you are, Amy, um, because I think that uh, a huge chunk of uh, Germany's power and also leadership capacity in Europe is structural and not personal. Of course, um, Angela Merkel, um, her personality, the fact that she had all the telephone numbers in her little notebook and that she was around forever, that contributed to Germany's power um, and, and to its ability to, to be a broker. But um, I think that Germany as, as such is just a factor in the European Union. You cannot do things without Germany or kind of around Germany. It's super difficult um, because the, the economic power. Um, and, and so I, yeah, we are just this big fat giant in the middle of Europe. And I think that is uh, structural and that gives us a lot of power. However, um, maybe the new EU will be less centered around Germany. And maybe this is also a good thing because I think you're right, kind of um, the new German chancellor doesn't have the, this kind of phone book full of numbers and the notebook um, and is less experienced. Although here again, um, Olaf Scholz, I mean, he has um, not single-handedly, of course, it was the chancellor and the finance ministry, but he has um, worked with uh, Bruno Le Maire um, pushing the recovery fund tr tr uh, through. And I think that was kind of, <laughs> a really <laughs> difficult task and and he did this he did succeed um so and i think that he knows how europe works to a certain extent already um and his coalition will be a very pro-european coalition with um although the fdp has um red lines when it comes to the transfer union the fiscal union whatever the fdp is a very pro-european party uh, with um, a lot of um, ambitions actually a very federalist party looking lo looking at the party um, program so but i think 
we will see a capable German government on the EU level. Um, we will see uh, continued German power. And, but, but still, I think um, it might be a little um, less focused on Germany because it's not only Macron, I think it's Mario Draghi um, and it's um, Pedro Sanchez in Spain. And, um, and I think there can be new alliances. And Sanchez uh, in Spain has already shown um, how this could work because he had actually not tried to be um, part of the Franco-German tandem and, and tr tried to meddle and to, to replace the UK. He has basically done his own thing and uh, tried to, um, to, to for, for example, work with the Netherlands, kind of a very um, a not usual suspect from a Spanish perspective. So, um, and I think, Germany um, will have more troubled times ahead because of, I, I think we will get a problem with our economy sooner or, or later with our, and I come to that in a minute. Um, and so maybe the future in general needs to be more flexible. Uh, and this German approach to have everybody on board hasn't, I mean, has brought unity. No other member state has left, but also the EU was not really able to take um, quick decisions. So I think maybe the future is, is more flexible here. Um, but yeah, uh, th there is no obvious heir to, to Merkel, but I think there are several uh, power poles then. So coming to Marcel's points, which I found super interesting, and this shows again that data is only worth uh, so much because it's really kind of how you look at it and what, what you make um, of it. So I, um, I had... Um, I had interpreted the Merkel-Macron question completely differently. So because my association with Merkel and Macron on the European level is different to yours. I think, yes, two ideas how Europe should be governed. But for me, and maybe that's also because um, um, every two years we do a, an expert poll within ECFR. We ask um, the in the 27 countries, we asked, it's basically a Parship or, or Tinder for for <laughs> for member states. It's kind of it's 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 um, um, yeah. It's an explorer that gives countries the opportunity to identify like-minded um, other countries. And we ask who is the most popular, but also who who is uh, kind of the, the one you share the most interests with, um, or who, kind of which country is most responsive. And uh, Germany. Um, came uh, first, um, like the past six years. Um, and, and it was always impressive how Germany had managed to, to have this web uh, of a dense connections, like a, a, a really a network, whereas um, France was significantly detached from Central and Eastern Europe, but also from Northern Europe. So what I think why the reason is why Merkel was so popular in our poll is really because I mean, if I, I was traveling through some smaller member states um, virtually throughout the past weeks talking about the German elections and in the in the smaller member states and especially those um, in um, Central and Eastern Europe, many people were really sad to see her go because um, they said we will never have a chancellor that kind of cares so much about us. So I think part of Merkel's popularity is really that Germany uh, has been the spider in the web, but has has paid close attention to smaller member states and has brought um, uh, everybody on board. Whereas Macron, at least in these regions, is and also in the Netherlands and also in the north of Europe, is perceived as disruptor, as divisive, as um, not actually, as you put it, as the the, the European um, uh, kind of super supranational. Um, Kind of front runner, but as um, a French president, very goalistic French president, pushing through, uh, having kind of talking a lot about Europe, but meaning uh, kind of France <laughs> in reality. So that's that's what what it ex explained for me. But your interpretation is, of course, also fascinating. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so, so I, I I I had looked at it differently, and same with the golden age. Um, for me, Golden Age was less connected to de um, democracy and um, satisfaction with the current government, but more with prosperity, full employment, wealthy, wealthy people, basically, in Germany. And when I look at, back at Germany, so there is this, maybe that's a bit nerdish, but the Thomas Bagger essay, when he wrote about um, 
1989 and, and implications for Germany. And he wrote about the German moment. And, and I think he had uh, coined a, a, a very important term here because I think the past 16 years were a, a German moment in Europe, but not a European moment. So whereas other member states were really struggling, um, the Germans did just fine. And even during the migration crisis, I mean, th th there was nearly full employment. There was prosperity. People yeah, were, 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 were well off. I mean, they were complaining all the time, but compared to their neighbors. Um, and so I think that during the coronavirus crisis, a lot of Germans realized how fragile this is because they suddenly discovered that our oh, infrastructure is not great in Germany, that a lot of things don't function, that schools, um, if they are forced to go in kind of remote mode, all of the sudden that that the system collapses um, that the that bureaucracy, bureaucracy collapses and that was my personal explanation for this that why so many Germans thought okay we <laughs> had some great years but now things are really starting to crumble this is not sustainable um, digitalization I mean we are a desert and so that's it was my explanation but I mean yours is equally um, valuable so it's that shows I think the, the limits of of the data. Um, for me, for the next German government, you mentioned human rights and democracy. And to be fair, it's not only Hungary, it's also Spain, the Netherlands and Denmark um, that kind of um, think highly of Germany. And I, um, and in Poland, they don't. Um, at, in Hungary, it might be that, um, I mean, Angela Merkel has left Viktor Orban off the hook uh, for a long time. Uh, one could argue uh, until the very last moment, maybe that uh, explains it, but I think, you know, there, I, I think that's also connected to this idea of Angela Merkel as the freeder, uh, as, the, as the leader of the free world. Um, so that's how I looked at it, why there was so much support for, for, for Germany. So there is this Merkel as a project space, uh, a projection space, you say in, in English. So people project what they think uh, onto her. Um, and I, I always thought um, that it's it's this, but I think it's a mandate for the next German um, government that is very valuable right now with our, uh, with, while we are struggling with Poland and Hungary, I think it shows that there are the expectations on Germany to uh, to be tougher, to be, to be, um, yeah, I don't know, to, to, to really make sure that other countries stick to the rules and not to, not to try to broker a compromise at all costs and bring everybody on board. So for me, the, the clear mandate for the next government from this poll was um, to, inside the European Union, um, be a caretaker for the rule of law and externally, because there the support was so poor to be a stronger geopolitical leader and to Europeanize China policy and Russia policy more and to give other countries less the impression that Germany and when in doubt uh, goes it alone. So that's what I took away. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, last word because you mentioned the FDP and the red lines again, and I think you're completely right. So what I heard, heard from the S, uh, from the FDP is that they wanted to make basically the security and defense um, story a narrative for the new coalition. That I think that would have uh, worked well with Amin Laschet. And you are totally right with the SPD and the Greens. It doesn't, um, even though they will wholeheartedly embrace the idea of European strategic autonomy or sovereignty or whatever. When it comes to the nitty gritty details, defense spending, uh, autonomous weapons, uh, arms exports, this coalition is um, heading into trouble, I think. So now I have been too long. Um, yeah. And I hand it over to Raphael for the other difficult questions that I refuse to answer. No, I think you covered a lot of ground there. But um, uh, let me come back to something that, that uh, Marcel only touched on at the, at the margins and this, that the role of the CDU, I think. Um, if we see a traffic light coalition forming, um, then it will also be the first time in eight years that uh, we'll have a big party in opposition. Um, during the last four years of the Grand Coalition, the AFD, the extreme right party, was the largest opposition party. Um, and you had uh, the Greens in there, the Die Linke as well, and the FDP, so quite quite a colorful bunch of uh, smallish opposition parties that couldn't really provide a strong counter-narrative to what the government was trying to sell. Um, and if we do get a traffic light coalition with Olaf Scholz at the helm, then we'll have a, a, a very, very large um, uh, CDU, CSU, parliamentary uh, group uh, in the Bundestag. If they get their house in order, if they uh, run a, a smooth leadership transition and sort of figure out what their 
um, uh, policy priorities are and a sort of general orientation, um, then we'll have a, a strong voice in, in the opposition again that can hold the government uh, uh, to account. Um, and that will probably position itself as a sort of attractive partner potentially to the Greens and the FDP going forward because um, uh, they will not likely look uh, towards the SPD to form another grand coalition in four years, but they will presumably try to peel off the two smaller coalition parties um, with, with potential offerings. Um, uh, they could also now turn um, to the right and, and look at the, the AFD as a potential coalition partner. We've seen in, in, at the local level in particular, some cooperation happening on, on the center to far right. Um, uh, in some of the German states, there has been sort of tested um, cooperation uh, and some issues. Um, but so far, the federal CDU has sort of rejected outright the idea of, of even cooperating with the AFD. That might change. I hope that it doesn't. But um, nevertheless, it's going to be um, more interesting and contentious politics that we'll see in the Bundestag, I think, over the next four years. Thank you very much for uh, these uh, interesting and several responses. Um, we got two questions, seven minutes left, um, two questions in the chat, one by Edward Brown and the other by Emra Shine. Um, what I would suggest is that um, uh, the first question is about the expectations for the Linke and the other uh, goes back to the data set. So my suggestion would be, I could answer the first question. You can also, of course, jump in if, if you like, and then go with the second question by Emma Shine, and maybe there will be a third one in the course of the rest of uh, our, our seminar. So uh, Edward Brown, I'm gonna read the question to everybody, uh, ask in this new era, how are the, uh, how are the Linke, uh, the left party expected to adapt slash regress after their mediocre performance and shifts in the voting preferences among the younger generations. Um, so what I would say about the Linke is that the Linke has a major problem and that is multiple splits within the party. The Linke is not one party, it's a party formed by a, a uh, plethora, I'm about to say, of uh, movements um, and the former SED, uh, Antifa, move, Antifa movements, um, uh, radical left movements from the old federal republic in the west, um, uh, former Stalinists, former Maoists, uh, and new social movements that pretty much came into the party after the split up of the SPD in the early 2000s in the course of uh, the welfare state reforms. So the, the Linke is a very pluralistic party and it remains a pluralistic party. And the problem is that the course that the Linke has taken in this election is pretty much um, a more welfare state oriented, but still post-materialist copy of the Greens. Um, that might be a little too pronounced, but I think this is pretty much what the Linke has done. The empty space, however, in the German party system is not where the Linke has positioned itself. That space is occupied by the Greens, especially for the younger generations. The empty space, and there's an interesting paper in the Center for Politik Wissenschaft, I think that shows that if I don't misinterpret it right now, is with authoritarian left. And this is pretty much the strategy that Sarah Wagenknecht tried to embrace um, a couple of months ago with the Aufstehen movement, um, which is a very classic authoritarian, economic oriented, uh, uh, oriented um, position. Um, that didn't play out within the left party. I think what we're looking at now is that the left party will face extreme uh, struggles, extreme conflicts, and it's actually totally unclear how this was uh, this will play out. Uh, because with uh, Sarah Wagner stepping down, now being a left-wing public intellectual, um, also the figurehead, if you will, of the classic uh, left within that party is gone. So this is really hard to say, and we will have to uh, wait for the party conference that is taking place in December. I don't know whether uh, Rafael and Jana, whether you would like to add something to that at this point um, about the left party. Um, maybe that's um, mm -hmm. early signs. I mean, it's still uh, very early after the election, but don't indicate um, that this kind of soul searching, what have we done wrong? Uh, why did this happen process has started? Um, I mean, I just, um, and it, it I, I, I've seen members of the Linke complaining about this utter lack of, yeah, kind of sober assessment of, of, of this election results. And, um, what I found interesting uh, news from today is that whereas Die Linke on a, on a federal level of obviously did not succeed, um, 
they will be part of, um, it was just decided today that they are likely part of two uh, German lender governments um, that in Berlin, um, not the traffic light collision that would have been possible uh, and, and would have been in the numbers uh, will be formed, but another red, red, green coalition and same is true for Mecklenburg uh, Pomerania where also a traffic light coalition I think would have been possible, but where um, the kind of SPD um, 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 Minister President um, Manuela Schwesig has just um, decided that she will uh, just kind of deepen coalition on negotiation or start them or can have in-depth uh, negotiations with Die Linke either. So they are not not gone uh, in, in on the lender level. They are still uh, alive and, and, and kicking, which is interesting to watch now how this kind of two decisions ha impact the ongoing negotiations on the federal level and whether because the FDP uh, already is kind of uh, snubbed <laughs> that they got neglected twice uh, so yeah let's see what kind of implications that will be looming all right um I would now proceed to the last question by Imra Shain and then hand it back to you Rafael and Jana so uh, the question reads as the data presented uh, address perceptions on a nation state and individual basis. I wonder what your data can and cannot tell us about the larger regions of Europe, uh, such as uh, Southeast versus Mediterranean or the perception of Merkel based on Germany's role in mitigating specific economic issues in specific countries and so on. Uh, whoever would like to respond, happy to hear your answer. Sure, thanks very much. Um, great, great question, Emra. Um, so if you recall the maps that we displayed briefly, then, then I think the, uh, the, the, the lesson learned there is that um, uh, there is no clear sort of regional preferences for German leadership or assessment of, of Germany really um, uh, under Angela Merkel. Uh, similarly, if you look at the question of whether Germany's golden age is in the past or present, it's sort of mixed. There's countries in the South that, that uh, are more optimistic and countries that are less optimistic. And the same is true for the North, for the East and for, the, for, the, for, for West Germany as well. Um, there's a bit of a general tendency, I think, that, that uh, Western perceptions of, of Germany, Spain, and Portugal are generally a bit more favorable um, than, than, than Hungary's and, and Poland. Um, although, again, the outlier on, of Hungary is, was surprising to us as well um, on, on some of the questions. But um, yeah, I, I think, again, the, the, the lesson learned is that, that uh, uh, German assessment sort of uh, is varies across regions but again uh, it's also very similar across regions in, in some in some ways um uh, looking looking at the data we do actually have one last question over in the q a um asking and this is a question i think many are are curious about um whether or not another grand coalition but this time with spd as the leader would be feasible and whether or not remaining in the opposition um, might not be better for the CDU, CSU for future elections. That, probably also better for the SPD, but that's, I'll let you folks uh, answer that. That is a super interesting one because I would have excluded another grant coalition because neither the SPD nor the CDU wants one and let alone the voters. Although earlier polls prior to the election um, had indicated that people were not um, as... Um, yeah, skeptical as, as I am, but um, so I, but now, interestingly, I mean, I think just um, to make that clear, I think this traffic light coalition will see the light of the day and I think early, earlier um, rather than later. Um, so I, I think it's a convincing argument that by, by Christmas we will have a traffic light coalition, but if that fails and it can always happen, it might be very tempting for the CDU, although they they would hate it, they would really hate it. But the problem is that the the party is now so much um, kind of struggling with infighting and with falling apart, and and they are kind of so not used to be in opposition. That is kind of what they don't consider the natural state of affairs. Um, <laughs> that I think when in doubt, I could see a temptation to say, yeah, we, for the sake of the country and we don't like it, but we will do it. Um, but that is because the, 
what I've seen after the election coming from the CDU that um, that I think when in doubt they might they might go for it. Although I think it would be a disaster for German democracy. But I don't know what you two think about this. I totally agree with everything you said. I just would like to to add one or two more very quick thoughts. Um, whoever has ever read um, Angelo Panabianco and his writings about uh, how external shocks um, affect political parties, um, the CDU-CSU is a super interesting case study on that. So what's happening now is that the, the elections have an extremely disruptive, disruptive effect on um, how the CDU-CSU functions internally. Actually, the leadership, formal, informal, is falling apart. Um, which means that at this point, I totally agree with you, it could be tempting for the leadership that is remaining also in order to keep um, their positions. Um, think about the general secretary, uh, secretary general, um, uh, thinking about also Armin Laschet maybe uh, to an extent. Um, they could agree to joining a coalition because they're seeing this centrifugal powers come into effect right now and being disruptive within the party and the CDU CSU will be disciplined when they are in government. It worked with the SPD and it will work with the CDU CSU, but the SPD is the more problematic part here because the SPD does not want another grand coalition, but at the same time, they would be the leading party, which means that whenever I talk to, to others, like um, it's also not my first talk on the German elections and when the question on the um, grand coalition comes up, um, there's always the argument the SPD won't do it. And I say, they might be more tempted to do it because they will be the leading party. They will be uh, the cook, not the waiter. Um, so um, it could be that for the sake of the country, they would also join a grand coalition. I would not rule that out. But there's another possibility. Uh, Amy Kropel and I discussed that earlier. I don't want to open this up like because that could like lead to an even uh, uh, longer discussion. But that is a minority government. It's relatively easy to uh, for a minority government to come into power based on the German basic law. And it could happen at one point. Um, I think that will be more likely if also a grand coalition fails than new elections. Just saying this at the very end of this panel. Throwing the bomb we as we've run out of time. Uh, <clears throat> Raphael, do you have any last words as Marcel has thrown this bomb? Just a, just a sort of very brief contrarian remark. I, I think some Europeans would appreciate another grand coalition because at least then Germany wouldn't reliably get anything done and there wouldn't be any surprises, mm -hmm. um, which, which some might expect from, from Olaf Scholz uh, and the Greens on defense issues, for instance, or the FDP on, on resistance towards the Eurozone reform. Um, with another grand coalition, they wouldn't get anything done, but that means that there wouldn't be any surprises either. Okay, so we have the uh, somewhat uh, pessimistic view uh, and a bomb thrower as our final words. I want to thank everyone uh, on the panel for joining us. We look forward to future collaboration and, and uh, information from ECFR. And I also want to thank Marcel uh, for participating and particularly those stalwart uh, attendees who have stayed with us past our end date. Uh, I hope that everyone has a wonderful day and I hope that we have an answer. Uh, and maybe we can revisit all of these questions once we know for certain. I'm rooting for a minority government just because I would love a minority government in a constructive vote of no confidence country just to have the example. Um, and I would like to remind uh, those remaining guests that they will get the survey as they're leaving. I hope that everyone has a wonderful day or evening if you're based in Europe. Uh, thanks so much for participating. <laughs>